Um, my name is Joe Fowler. I'm a scientist at the U.S. National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, at their Boulder, Colorado laboratories. I'm also with the University of Colorado. And I have some, a, a presentation today about work going on at NIST in two different labs to improve X-ray fluorescence metrology and to do so in a modern 21st century way. First, let me find how to stop video. Excellent. So the concept of the measurement is simple enough. We point an extremely complex object at things in the periodic table and we measure them. And in this particular measurement that we've done with superconducting microcalorimeter detectors, we measured four elements circled there from the lanthanide series between elements 59 and 67. <clears throat> so let me remind you that X-ray wavelength or energy standards have uses over an enormous range of fields. Um, chemical analysis, uh, astrophysics, astrophysical plasmas, if you want to measure the velocity of something, you need an absolute calibration of what the energy scale is for the measurement. Um, diagnostics of plasmas, such as at the National Ignition Facility or any other um, fusion research sort of system. Um, highly charged ions are good for testing quantum electrodynamics and other aspects of atomic theory. And we've worked with collaborators based mainly in Japan who build uh, spectrometers to measure exotic atoms at particle beam lines, an exotic atom in which a pion, muon, kaon, or any other unstable particle releases, replaces a single electron in, uh, in an atom. And that's a test of both QED and quantum chromodynamics, the strong force. Um, crystallography and other diffraction measurements, any sort of electron microscopy with elemental specificity, they all need X-ray wavelength and energy standards. Now, there is an existing standard, and it turns out we've discovered that we at NIST are the custodians, at least of the U.S. national standard for fluorescence line energies. You can find it two different places. Uh, our internal name for it is the Standard Reference Database number 128. At this website listed in the top right, you can find access, you can get access to these transition energies. The same data also appears in print in a Review of Modern Physics article from 17 years ago by Dick DeLott and collaborators at NIST and um, uh, abroad in Europe. Um, I'm showing you 1% of the main table, table number five from that publication. This is about half of a page from the 45 page um, um, table. And you're seeing a selection of lines from element 59, praseodymium, and 60, neodymium. These are two of the ones we measure. That's why I picked this. And I just want to show you what is, and maybe more importantly, what is not in this standard database. Um, you can see along the left the diagram lines involving uh, filling holes in the K or L shells are listed, as well as the K and L edges of every atom. Um, you can see from the second and third columns that there are both theory and experiment numbers whenever possible, including one sigma uncertainties, as well as a pointer to the literature. But keep an eye on these references. If you look in the praseodymium column, you'll see that every reference is citation number one. Um, and in the right, you'll also notice uh, number 29. Keep an eye on these. We'll, we'll see these in the next slide. Um, there's a few neodymium lines with reference three. That's a more modern measurement by Delat's team but they're more the exception than the rule. So in short, there are a number of problems with this standard reference database. And the first is just that three quarters of these lines reference publications that are at least 50 years old. And the reason for that is that, of course, the team had to favor completeness over um, contemporary measurements, otherwise it's not a useful reference. And it's based largely on wavelengths that were given in a earlier review, a 1967 review by Joyce Bearden, and that is reference number one. Probably 70% of the lines in this 21st century database uh, are really just copied from Bearden. And even those were not necessarily measured in the 60s. Many of them are from before 1950. Um, one of my collaborators in Gaithersburg graciously looked up the details of one particularly egregious example, the yttrium K-alpha line that Bearden reports, it's a weighted mean of three different measurements, all of them over 90 years old. I don't know if you'll be relieved to know that we get a little more statistical weight from the most recent of these three. Um, and I suppose yttrium may seem like an obscure material, but of course it's a pretty important component of a material system in uh, uh, cuprate high temperature superconductors. So it's a little 
it's a little disturbing that this is the heritage of some of that data. And one reason I mentioned 50 years as an important cutoff, it's that in the early 70s, so less than 50 years ago, it was finally uh, Delat's team at NIST first um, invented a system that tied optical and x-ray interferometry together, and that for the first time anchors x-ray wavelength measurements to the SI meter. So any data from before that are not anchored to the meter. Of course, if that was the only problem, there would be 1967 data would be all self-consistent. It would only need a single correction factor to bring it into the modern SI era. Um, the lot estimate that correction factor to be wavelengths need to be lengthened by, I think it was 15 parts per million. Um, but maybe the bigger problem with old data is that experimental conditions, uh, material properties, oxidation state, and above all systematic errors, if, if they were uh, ever understood, they've long ago been lost in the dark depth of time. Um, I pointed out reference 29. Here's the key figure from reference 29. Um, a 1970 measurement, meaning it's one of the newest of these 75%. Uh, fraction crystal put um, the spectrum onto an emulsion, which was full graft and reproduced here. Um, it's, it's a brilliant measurement, but it would be awfully hard to reconstruct. Intensities are completely lost. Systematic errors would, would just never be be reconstructable from such a thing. And that's sort of representative of a lot of the data in this database. Um, additional problems. So the first two are the ones I mentioned. There's also the fact that theory and experiment often agree, but they often disagree within their stated errors. If you look at the lower plot, you can see just selecting the seven brightest L lines of the four lanthanide elements that we're going to measure, I've just plotted from the database uh, vertical axis, the uncertainty, the one sigma stated uncertainty, and the y, the x-axis is the energy. Uh, very crudely, the size of these dots represents intensity of the lines. Um, and you can see half of these, particularly for terbium and praseodymium, they all have stated uncertainties of more than 0.3 EV. And 0.3 EV is a target we think we can get to with these modern superconducting microcalorimeters. Um, so, and of course, even if the data that have a stated uncertainty better than this, we're not sure how well we can trust all of it in the oldest cases. If you look at the right, you can see the brightest uh, doublet of the L lines of holmium, the L alpha one line in particular, the bright one. Um, you can see this uh, modern measurement from a synchrotron in Europe, I think the one in Grenoble. The team has measured a very asymmetric shape but nothing in this database is there to characterize line widths or asymmetry or anything about shapes, whether they're complex or simple. And then finally, there are transitions that just aren't there at all. Transitions in which a hole is filled by an O or higher shell electron, M lines are completely absent. So before I talk about measurements, I guess I'd like to say what I think of as the ideal reference data. Um, an ideal reference database for the 21st century would not be a line energy database. It would be a spectral database and everything in it would have full line shapes, full characterization of a line profile. Of course, it would also have absolute calibration and a full accounting of all the, the uncertainties. And we know this is doable in specific cases. I've, I've shown two uh, measurements on the right, uh, the K alpha doublet of iron and the K beta line of cobalt characterized by a sum of Lorentzians. Um, I'm now going to talk about measurements by the two laboratories at NIST, but I of course have to point out that there are many other summary uh, efforts to try to improve on these data. There are certainly commercial proprietary databases. If you buy a Rogaku or Bruker system that does uh, XRF analysis, it, it almost certainly contains added tweaks beyond what's public. Um, Tim Elam there in Seattle has compounded a lot of X-ray fundamental parameters for, um, well, his own work is in Mars rover an analytic tools. There's a X-ray fundamental parameters group based out of Europe and a European subset of this team has gotten some industry funding to make certain measurements uh, that were bothering industry partners. Um, and of course, there's the book by Chornak. If you go look at it, you'll see that it adds to the um, NIST reference data width and relative intensity information. Um, I'll pause super briefly. All right, no questions. So I mentioned there are two NIST teams. The main NIST site in Gaithersburg, Maryland 
has a team working on two different crystal diffraction spectrometers, which I'll describe next. Um, and at Boulder, we have a team working on microcalorimeters, superconducting detectors. There are actually dozens of people in it. I've only listed the ones who worked on this specific metrology measurement. Dan Schmidt is the inventor of these detectors. There are multiple publications from these groups on both sides, the diffraction and the microcalorimeter side. And most of the data I will show from the latter is new data we took uh, just a couple years ago uh, to improve on the previously published measurement of lanthanides. So here's an image of the vacuum double crystal spectrometer, one of the two um, diffractometers. It's designed for work up to 12 keV, and it's capable of making absolute wavelength measurements at a part per million. And I should point out, you know, the, the diffractometers measure wavelength, the microcalorimeters energy, but uh, as of less than one year ago, we've redefined the kilogram in an artifact-free way. That means Planck's constant is just a number you can look up. And that means there's no more ambiguity in converting between X-ray wavelength and energy. They are one and the same thing once you know HC. Um, this uses a pair of crystals that are highly calibrated reference crystals that have had um, X-ray optical interferometry done on them to, to um, measure their exact lattice spacing, which needs to be known to better than a part in a million to make this measurement. On the one hand, this is a very old instrument. You can read about it. It's Delat's own instrument from NIST, and you can read about it in reviews of scientific instruments from 1967 but it is completely remade like a ship of Theseus in which uh, the motion, the angle encoders, and the X-ray detectors have all been re redone um, largely by the work of my colleague Chilla Saifo Foster who got me these images. Um, a key point about double crystal spectrometers is that when they're two crystals doing the diffraction, you can satisfy the Bragg condition for constructive interference in two different orientations of the second crystal. Two of the different modes are shown here. The source and the first crystal in blue are kept in the same uh, place for both kinds of measurements, but in the non-dispersive mode, um, all energies interfere at the same place. Uh, and this is a way of both finding the zero angle as well as learning about the energy resolving or healing through the function of the instrument. But then you turn around the second crystal, sorry, this, yeah, the second crystal, and now the different wavelengths are dispersed to different angles, and this is a spectrograph in this um, orientation. And by using this sort of system, you've turned an absolute wavelength measurement into an angle difference measurement. Um, diffraction always turns it into an angle measurement, but the double crystal lets it be an angle difference measurement. I'm sure I've oversimplified in Porchillas, thinking of all the things I just got a little bit wrong, but sorry about that. The second instrument is this parallel beam diffractometer. It's tuned, um, optimized for higher energies up to 80 keV, but it's also a double crystal spectrometer. Uh, because of the higher energy, it doesn't need to be in a vacuum shell. There's a uh, free space operation, but this room is a pretty amazing place where every instrument in it and the whole room itself are regulated to hundredth of a degree to make sure that all these angles and lengths are not changing during a measurement. Um, its main purpose is to measure certain standard reference materials that a person who wants to have a reference material for a powder diffraction instrument can buy. These uh, standardized line shape and position for such powder diffraction instruments and you can go buy these. Actually, you should probably peruse sometime the NIST standard reference materials. It's a pretty exotic list of things. There are standard cigarettes you can buy if you're involved in fire research and you want to know how fast your sheets or upholstery catches fire. PDB doesn't work on that. So this team has been hard at work making new measurements and published data include uh, the K-alpha lines of copper and molybdenum as well as the K-beta of molybdenum made with both instruments. Um, platinum has been measured, but it's not published, so I, I didn't show it here. The strengths of this sort of extremely precise and accurate instrument are, first of all, the part per million accuracy, and the fact that you can do direct calibration to the SI. But weaknesses just include the fact that the signal is so low, it's a very slow process, and there are a limited number of anode materials that can be used to, to make such measurements. And that's where the microcalorimeters come in. Um, if you attended this journal club 
three and a half weeks ago, my colleague Kelsey Morgan presented um, how a transition edge sensor works. So I will summarize it again because I think it's um, both cool and to many people unfamiliar. So this is the sort of uh, microcalorimeter array we used for this measurement. These are designed and fabricated in the NIST Boulder Labs. Um, you're seeing on top of a penny, which is 19 millimeters in diameter, you're seeing an aperture array with 192 holes so that x-rays only land on the 192 sensors of the lower right-hand chip. These are sensors held at their superconducting transition of 0.1 Kelvin. It's an array of 192. For this measurement to get the best control over systematics, we used only the central 20% or so that can reduce um, crosstalk and other effects and for metrology that just seem worth the trade-off. The bottom line is that these sensors have something like four EV resolution, Gaussian energy response function, that's its full width and half maximum in the hard X-ray range. So the principle of operation, like any other calorimeter, um, a TES is, has a combination of two, um, does two different things. There needs to be an absorber, which converts radiant energy to thermal energy, and then a thermometer to measure how much energy was converted. So on the left is a cartoon idea of the, the island of a TES is held at its superconducting transition temperature, again, 111 millikelvin. It has a heat capacity C, and so when it absorbs a photon of energy E, there's an almost instantaneous jump in the temperature of E over C, that's the definition of C. And because it's weakly coupled to an even colder heat bath by thermal conductance G, the, the temperature recovers over a time proportional to C over G. It's actually sped up by certain electrical feedback effects. And the thermometer aspect is that the TES itself is made out of a superconducting bilayer, in this case, molybdenum and copper. Superconductors right on their transition are uh, extremely sensitive thermometers. The resistance is a very sharp function of temperature. Because we embed this in a voltage biasing circuit, the more or less constant voltage going through this temperature variable resistor that is suddenly increased in temperature leads to a pulse in the current, a brief deficit, a transient that recovers to a baseline level over millisecond timescales. And these images and a great description of the concept are in Physics Today from a couple of years ago by Kelsey Morgan. So there's a lot to reading out a TES array. Um, the array itself is shown at the top of this image on the left. That's an instrument about the size of a coffee can and the whole thing needs to be held at uh, 0.1 Kelvin or, or less. Um, the detectors are on the top facing up. There's a lot of support electronics around the side, including um, squid-based amplifiers that have been arranged in a rather clever system to allow multiplexing so that one warm readout channel can read up to 32 or 40 TESs in various arrangements by reading them out one after the other and getting back to each one so fast that the signal hasn't changed. Such a system has to be built into a, this thing in the middle, a commercial cryostat, it's sort of human size scale. There's an adiabatic demagnetization refrigerator to achieve the 50 millikelvin or so without any liquid nitrogen or liquid helium. And then there's some electronics that our group has also designed to operate these squid amplifiers and read them out. So data looks like this from TES. Um, the top panel is just a tenth of a second of data when we were using a manganese fluorescence target running at 100 pulses per second. Um, so the raw data looks like the blue trace, but before we work with it, we use a triggering algorithm in the data acquisition computer to find a single record. And whenever that record doesn't have pileup, we can treat it in isolation. And in the bottom, you're seeing eight example pulses. Um, they, this, these are from the actual metrology measurement. Eight different pulses at eight energies, color-coded to help you. Um, they're all basically the same shape. The recovery time is essentially the same. It's a nearly linear detector. Um, there is noise on these eight pulses. You just can't see it because the resolving power is so high or the resolution is so good. So to get individual pulse records to energy spectra, there are two main steps. And one is an optimal estimation of how big is that pulse? That's a statistical question, one of removing bias. A lot of ink has been spilled on how to do this, including by me, but that's not really the most difficult part for this measurement. The harder part is once we have an optimal estimate of the pulse height, how to calibrate that size into energy. That's important in every situation, but especially in energy metrology. So we'll talk about that, but it, 
first I have to show what it involves. We, we measure various targets, some of which are the science targets, but others have to be calibrators with well-known energies. Um, Galen O'Neill designed this particular um, sample switcher. On the left, you see a top schematic view. There's a commercial tube source making x-rays by putting high energy electrons onto tungsten. That makes the green x-rays that illuminate this hexagonal sample switcher, which absorbs and refluoresces some of them, some of which are absorbed and uh, make it to the TES array. And this switcher is uh, rotatable by computer control. There are six different targets, a mix of calibrators and science. And the goal was to be able to switch between them in fairly rapid succession, not milliseconds, although that's a future goal, but in one minute timescales or shorter in order to get the best possible matching of gain under these different spectral conditions. Um, I'm talking about calibration, so it's a little bit of a cheat to show this. Um, this is an already calibrated set of spectra from six different targets that contain only transition metals, transition metals whose K-line shapes and energies are very well characterized by uh, precision diffractometers. And we're going to use the peaks that we see in these calibration spectra to anchor calibration curves that will allow us to study unknown energies. Um, the top three spectra in the darker colors are um, used for the praseodymium and neodymium L lines, which are only up to about 7 keV. For the measurement involving terbium and holmium, where the lines were of slightly higher energy, we used a different set of transition metals. But um, and it also happens that the tungsten primary source, some of those x-rays were reflected and help us anchor the calibration curve at, at higher energies. So the calibration procedures like this, the, the first step is we need to fit some of these well-known K lines. On the right, you're seeing a single sensor. This has to be repeated for all 50 plus of them for every day that we did the work. And you're seeing the uncalibrated um, pulse heights on the x-axis, and then those are in black, the data. The fits are shown in red, and you can barely see the data because the fits work great. The fits are to spectra measured by um, groups in Vienna, Germany, um, Australia, Melbourne as well. And with this sort of prior knowledge of the shapes and exact energies, we can measure our calibration anchor points to a, um, close to the hundredth of an EV stated uncertainty in the positions. Um, so then our job is to, once we've measured some well-calibrated lines, place them on an energy versus pulse height plane, interpolate some sort of best curve, the calibration curve. Plenty of art and thinking goes into that, but I won't say more. And then when you make new measurements, you can convert their pulse heights to an energy just by looking them up on this curve. Of course, that has to be repeated for each sensor. The sensors differ mainly in a five or 10% gain variation, but that's not the only thing. Still, we believe that this procedure makes it possible to get close to 0.1 EV over most of this range. Um, I said we have a published metrology result that was based on 2013 data, and we're working on new data, and the instrumentation is improved in several important ways between the two. One is just we're using sensors that are farther from their saturation energy, and that makes them more linear. They also happen to have somewhat better resolution. Oh, yeah. Sample switcher is a major improvement. And finally, we have a, Gauss, a much more Gaussian energy response. Um, when I say linearity, here's what I mean. This is a plot of the slope on a log log plot of the calibration curve as a function of energy. A perfectly linear sensor where pulse size proportional energy would look like the black line. The new instruments are closer to 0 0.9. That means that the pulse size is growing roughly as the 0.9 power of energy. But the earlier measurement it was closer to the 0.75 power. And for this measurement, we think the more linearity, the, the more we win. That improves the systematic uncertainty on the energy calibration. And work led uh, by NIST plus our collaborators at Argonne National Lab led us to really understand an important fact about the X-ray absorbing material that we had been using, evaporated bismuth has a lot of great properties, but apparently fast thermalization of 100% of the energy was not one. So here you're seeing the manganese K alpha spectra measured by the same kind of sensor, but with three different absorbers. And the older data used this evaporated bismuth that has what you see in purple, this sort of 1% low energy exponential tail. And that really degrades the signal to noise on the low energy side of bright lines. But the new data used gold as the absorber and the problem's gone.
So thanks to Dai Kang Yen and her collaborators and, and his team for that. So here's what the science spectra look like. These are the four lanthanides we measured with microcalorimeters across the relevant energy range containing um, going from the lowest possible L diagram line on the left to the L1 edge. Um, holmium and neodymium, purple and red, have been scaled up by three orders of magnitude to have less conflict between the plots. Um, but you can see there are a lot of features to try to make sense of. So there's, uh, well, a highly resolving instrument makes a big difference. Here's the same terbium L line emission spectrum in blue. It's what we measured. And gray is the same spectrum, but redone as if with a solid state detector that had 120 EV for with half maximum resolution. Now, I'm sure you know the resolution makes a big difference, but I find this sort of visually arresting. This plot with seven broad blobs would be awfully hard to make detailed sense of. We see at least five times as many features in the four EV spectrum. Um, I said that a goal is a database of spectra, not just of line energies. And that means we need some sort of analytic form for the profiles of lines near the peak. And over the last two and a half decades, many authors have used, come to the more or less the same conclusion that the proper way to do this is to sum multiple Voigt functions until the data are well fit by that sum. If you're not familiar with a Voigt function, it is simply the convolution of a Lorentzian with a Gaussian. It's a special function one can look up. It's also the real part of something known as the Fediva function. If you want to look it up in the NIST um, special functions table, the Lorentzian part is meant to capture the broad um, lifetime based atomic physics effects. And the Gaussian is at least an idealized version of an energy response function. Um, do we want to take a short break here for yeah. a few questions? I was just wondering that as well. Sure. OK, let me go ahead and, uh, and uh, give you a, um, a few questions. Um, first, what, what, what's the dominant cause of the sensor to sensor variation? Ooh, I'm going to have to say fabrication details. Mm -hmm. You know, trying to maintain a sensor right on that transition is only possible because of electrical feedback. The biasing at a constant voltage helps to do it so that if the temperature is a little too high, less current flows, less self-heating happens, and it, it tends to find its way back to the right spot. But when we share a common voltage bias line to all the sensors, slight fabrication differences can mean that they all end up on a slightly different spot in their transition. Not to mention that bilayer fabri fabrication is, is um, an amazingly accomplished art, but there are going to be variations in the thickness of the, of the molybdenum and the copper across the array. So I, I just think details like that. Sure, I understand. Um, uh, does the pulse height to energy curve stay the same over the lifetime of a sensor? Well, that is an excellent question that we've spent a lot of time exploring. I think the answer is less than you would hope. Um, but the biggest reason it will vary is if you turn on the array, maybe it's just cooled down for the first time after being serviced or something. We need to do a, a long series of characterizations and calibrations that we call auto tuning that's to try to optimize the sensors. And they're to land in a slightly different place um, when you do that. I think I'd say that at this scale, doing the recharacterizing, maybe warming up and cooling down again, that's sort of a 10 or 20 EV effect. However, merely going home for the night and coming back the next day, that's more like a one EV effect. So it's something we absolutely have to worry about, but it's, I guess it's as small as I could dream of it being. Okay. Um, but we treat it as the same thing all day long. Okay. Uh, what fraction of the energy uh, typically escapes the sensor from Auger or photon out processes and so on? And is that energy dependent? The fraction that escapes is typically none. If by typically we mean half the time. Um, uh, so the, the most important effect of energy escaping that we see um, are called escape peaks in which the gold absorber 
immediately re-emits a fraction of its energy as a gold M line. And that is manifest in the spectrum, not in a way that you can see uh, here because they're all off to the left. But these are like two echoes that are two KeV below the brightest peaks. Two KeV comes from the M lines of gold. Um, that is the most important energy loss effect, although this electroplated bismuth also has the effect of energy not so much being lost as being trapped for arbitrarily long times. That's why we wanted to go to new bismuth processes or gold for the absorber. Okay. Um, uh, Matt Carpenter, you've got a question. You can go ahead and unmute. Okay. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi, Joe. Thank you. Um, I had a question about slide 17. I was looking at the spectra that you presented there. Um, down between four and five KeV, or you have it labeled an EV, a couple small pairs of peaks that pop up in a few of your spectra that seemed in odd locations to me. And I wanted to know if those were artifacts or if you could comment on their origin. Oh, that is a perfect question right now, Matt. And here is why. <laughs> Those are the echoes I was talking about. Look at the red spectrum in the bottom. So there's a very bright peak, the cobalt K alpha doublet at 6.9 keV. If you move to the left by 2.1 and 2.2 keV, which is the energy that would be lost if a gold M alpha or M beta escaped the system, those appear at exactly 4.7 and 4.8 keV. That's where you see those funny two bright, well, dim but pronounced peaks at 4.8 kV in the red and the gold spectrum, but you don't see them in the others because only red and gold, sorry, you don't see them in green because green doesn't contain cobalt. So fortunately, two and a half, sorry, 2.2 kV, the echoes being that far away, that's enough that it, it interferes very little with our ability to measure the L lines because the L line spectrum itself is only about 2 kV wide and we didn't have any unfortunate collisions of that sort. But it is something we absolutely characterized and did as part of the fitting. Okay. Um, uh, uh, Richard, uh, you have a question? Yes, thank you. Um, I recently used the uh, uh, iron alpha line parameters from Hölzer, and it seems like the width parameter for the K alpha 2, 2, and 2, 3 lines are switched. Um, I just wanted to ask if this is a well-known factor, uh, fact and also um, how to report or how to find out if there's an error. I, we have not noticed an effect where, well, either we are not aware about that and we should communicate about it or we fixed this a decade ago and I've forgotten. <laughs> um, Perhaps something the two of you can follow up on. Yeah, we should probably follow up on that. I mean, it absolutely could be. Maybe I just mistyped what they said and got it right by accident. Yeah, we yeah, should follow up. <laughs> sure. All um, right. Uh, well, why don't, uh, why don't you uh, continue now and I'll keep uh, watching for more questions. Thanks. And, and I am not watching, so I appreciate it. No, that's my job. That's all right. That's what I thought. You're the host. Um, so representing the spectrum in uh, the most parsimonious possible way seems to be that the community has decided that a sum of a few void functions, as few as you can get away with, um, is a very handy way to do so. And if um, you use an instrument with resolution far better than any of the, the energy scale of any features, then a void function becomes a Lorentzian. With the microcalorimeters, with the 4 EV resolution, we don't have that luxury, so we have to think of it as a sum of void functions. Um, and here are just two examples of other groups having done so. One is the NIST parallel beam diffractometer team in Maryland, uh, copper K alpha, and on the right, vanadium K beta by the Melbourne team. Um, I'll just point out one thing that can trip one up is the zero resolution limit of a void function. Because a void function with uh, a Gaussian part given by an instrument's resolution may make a really nice match to the data, but it's not clear what happens when you then dial in the resolution term 
to zero. That is effectively a deconvolution. And as I conclude this slide, deconvolution is always a bad idea, but I know that we can't resist doing it and I imagine no one else could either. So here's an example. We've zoomed in on one line, the L gamma one line of praseodymium. And in the faint blue, sorry, black is the data as measured. In faint blue, you're seeing an excellent fit. And below you're seeing the residuals, those, um, curves represent the plus or minus one and two sigma Poisson counting statistics uncertainty. So it's quite an, a good fit to the four EV data. But if we take that same fit, dial the Gaussian component to zero as if we had an ideal zero resolve resolution instrument, then the fit looks like the thicker blue line with this funny off center peak, which, you know, we have no way to say that it's not real. I just say it's a dubious feature and that if we repeat this procedure on all the lines we measured, we see this over and over again. Many, many spectral profiles will fit well at the resolution we measure and then look a little sketchy in the zero resolution limit. We tried a number of strategies that involved putting a penalty term in the fit or regularization. Um, none of those in general could really fix what our intuition said was a problem. Um, and here's where we landed on that. Our solution was to use Voigt functions whose Gaussian component is not merely that of our energy resolution, but to allow an extra fit parameter to let that Gaussian width be even larger. And when we repeat the same fit, the left in blue is what I showed before, the same fit done with this new one degree of freedom um, leads to a much less dubious looking Voigt function in this zero resolution limit. So again, the, the best advice would be never take the zero resolution limit. You're a fool to do that. If someone measured something with a resolution of 4 EV, you shouldn't look at what it would have been in a better world. That's deconvolution. It's always bad, but people will do this. I will do it. And we're excited about this fitting form because by adding one extra degree of freedom, it really suppresses small scale structure in that limit without any sort of sacrifice in fit quality. So I just like to look at a few examples of what these transitions look like when we zoom in on them. These are the L M transitions of the four elements. So top to bottom, it's the four elements with the, the same color code throughout. Um, the different dashed and dotted gold colors are various um, aspects of the background. Each gray curve is a Voigt component. Honestly, it's not Voigt, it's Voigt times our model of the quantum efficiency, which is what a Voigt function would look like in our spectra. Small effect, but worth saying. And then the sum of all the void functions is the black. Um, you're not seeing how good the entire model, including background is because it's, it's so good it would just clutter the plot. These really can be characterized by a limited number of void functions. If we turn a little higher in energy near the L3 edge, these L3 edges are shown with roughly with the gray vertical lines on each plot. Um, the brightest peak in each is the L beta two or two comma 15 lines, but there are at least four other lines also seen and they're marked in at least two of the spectra with a vertical orange and, and red lines. There's a lot of information here. There's a lot of complicated atomic physics um, and there's a lot to be extracted from a spectrum with such high resolving power. Let me point out one cool thing that has certainly been measured in K lines, but I'm not aware of a measurement of it in L lines, and that's radiative OJ emission. So when an atom is excited and has an inner shell vacancy, it can release the energy needed to fill that vacancy in multiple ways. And we've been talking about one, fluorescence, in which all the free energy goes to an X-ray photon, leading to the characteristic fingerprints of an atom, the fluorescence lines. And you also are aware of a different method, the Auger effect, in which the energy is given to an electron, which is promoted often um, freed. But both things can happen at the same time. A two electron effect in which one electron fills a vacancy and another is liberated, taking away say 100 or so EV, and the photon gets only the balance. And we see evidence for this effect in the form of a broad echo that's typically 80 to 125 EV below the brightest fluorescence lines, the, the ones I've listed here. And I've circled eight examples. Um, in the top right, you see this double peak, that's uh, chromium from the stainless steel vacuum shell. It's a parasitic, but it's something we've characterized throughout and, and, and we can sort of subtract from the fit. But there's um, RAE in just about every place we would, would be able to look for it. 
So that may be a paper in itself, but we're still, um, we're excited to see that effect. And it's something that's worth noting if you imagine deploying an analytical tool, say to a place analyzing rare earth metal ores, because the, this RAE echo of one line could contaminate your measurement of the next line down or down in the periodic table. So it's something we definitely want to characterize. I'll say no more. Um, I said our goal is to understand the systematic uncertainties. I won't belabor them just to point out that some of the most important ones are just the absolute energy scale, the consistency of the gain across the six sides of the six-sided sample switcher and interpolation. This is a plot showing what we think is our best estimate of that systematic uncertainty as a function of energy. There were two different measurements for the lower and the higher Z materials, so there's, there's two different panels here. Um, and for much of the the business end of this spectrum, that number is around 0.2 EV or better for most lines under 8 keV. But um, these other items in gray, D through H, these are less important, but we've certainly considered how much our analysis is affected by things like uncertainty in the energy resolution or in the quantum efficiency model. Um, how sure are we that the low energy tail isn't there? These are all subdominant effects. It's really the calibrating and interpolating based on standards is, is really the dominant uncertainty. At least we've reached that point now. Um, so I guess this is the, the, the last thing I wanted to mention is that if we want to compare our spectral database that we're just beginning to form with existing databases that only contain the energy of a line, you have to ask, what does that even mean? And the idealized version is that the peak, that the, the, these databases give the peak energy. And the peak is what you would see in a noise-free, zero-resolution idealized instrument. But of course, we measure lines at a resolution of 4 ED. If we wanted to know where the peak would be at any worse resolution, no problem, we can do convolution. But the standard data tables ask for where that peak would be in the limit of zero resolution. And that, again, is a difficult deconvolution problem. Um, this example sh pictured here is the Hülser model of the K-beta line of iron. This is one of the most extreme cases where the, the peak shifts by as much as half an EV in this, at this, this level, but um, it's a real effect at the quarter to half EV level in almost all of these whenever there is asymmetry in the line. Fortunately, I guess the, the key point is that we really only need to know the peak energy if we want to compare with the past and compare with existing reference data. For going forward, if there someday becomes a standard table of spectra, this extra systematic isn't going to matter so much. This is kind of a side, but I wanted to mention one last thing is that chemical shifts exist. Chemical effects have been measured with TESs. Here is uh, the K alpha and K beta line of titanium shown where we used six different chemical forms of titanium, probably because we have a six-sided sample switcher. And they're in four different oxidation states. And we observed that as expected, the oxidation state certainly shifts the K alpha line. And the different states also show different satellite features for the K beta line. None of that has been considered in the metrology data yet, but it's you know, something we're certainly capable of, of, of doing and exploring in the future. So let me just conclude before we take some more questions. I think with this and our previous measurement, we've really established that in spite of being nonlinear and challenging to work with, the TES microcalorimeter really has a role to play. It can measure hard X-ray spectra with a resolution of 4 EV or a resolving power of 2,000 to 1, while remaining absolutely calibrated at two tenths of an EV. Which, um, you know, I, th I, when we went into this, this is what we hoped we would find, but it's taken a lot of work to get there. We've used this to observe the lanthanide. Um, uh, around 100 lines of four different lanthanide metals. And when I say observed, I mean we should be able to characterize the full line profiles and estimate the peak energy for comparison to earlier databases. And our colleagues in Maryland in the two, running the two diffractometer instruments are also producing new high quality measurements of line profiles. There's a synergy we're going to need. If we move to softer or harder X-ray regions, they're going to be a dearth of well-studied, well-characterized lines that the microcalorimeters will need as anchor points to reference their calibration curves. And that's absolutely, we're gonna be relying on the diffraction spectrometer team to help us with that. 
And there are plenty of future possibilities. Other energy ranges, like I just said, these data contain relative intensities. That's not something we've published, but we're starting to think about how that might be useful. And as I just mentioned, chemical effects. But that's where I'd like to stop and take some more questions about modern metrology in the 21st century. Thanks. Oh, thank you. That's, uh, that's really fascinating. I've got um, a few people with questions. Uh, Jens, uh, do you have your mic on? Yes, I have. Hi, Hi. Joe. Uh, Hello. Hi. Hey, nice to see you. Nice to hear you. Very nice talk. Uh, you actually answered part of the questions already. Uh, the uh, calibonium or this calibration target which you use, uh, it's like, uh, how did you calibrate it? So this was sent to the beamline, and have you seen any changes of the oxidation state this time? I mean, if he really exposes his x-rays over time, I would expect that there are some aging effects or some other parts. And uh, since you're linking, uh, you're, uh, linking the energies you measure and also the shapes on the exact position and exact features inside this carbonium, uh, would this, how does this change yeah, over time? These are hard questions, uh, except for the one about sending the exact materials to a synchrotron, we did not do that. So we are assuming that these metals are in the same form as Holzer, Chandler, Smale, and other um, uh, Mendenhall, others who have measured the same materials. So we're assuming all iron is the same. That I realize conflicts with the last slide I showed where we said there are chemical effects and chemical shifts. Um, I guess the best answer is that at this time, we believe and hope that the this contributes to our uncertainty at the same level as the other effects, the fraction of an EV level. But um, I suppose that is what we'd really want to do is, is characterize our exact sample and not assume that every sample of cobalt is the same. Um, oh, and you asked about variation with time. The biggest variation with time we see is that the neodymium turns from a metal into a red powder. Wow. So it's important to keep that under argon until the measurement and then throw it away. But. That's good. Uh, could you actually follow up? Uh, I think it would be actually interesting in those for other people using your microcalibrators if you uh, have characterized these calibration targets, uh, if you could actually share them, uh, if you found a good composition, which is something... Uh, we can all use because uh, if you use the same target, at least we have uh, across the microcalibrometry uh, community, we have the same calibration. I think this would be very interesting. So you're thinking of a, as if a standard reference material for, for such calibrations. Um, where do I have, I'm trying to find the slide with the sample switcher. I mean, as you can see, these samples are either foils of metal or pieces of metal from a chemical supply company. Um, they come with chemical assays. It was interesting to see that quite a few of the rare earths contain other rare earths. We didn't really pay much attention to the 0.1% admixtures of cerium in our data, uh, sorry, in our samples, until I went and found cerium L-alpha doublets in the data and then I went back and checked the chemical, the vendor's assay, and it said, sure enough, cerium will probably be there at the level of 0.2%. Um, so because of this sort of thing, I could absolutely imagine the value in, in, in buying a big chunk of it and saying, this is the standard praseodymium that we use to make these measurements. But I, I have to say, we hadn't really thought of that before. We bought small amounts and used them. Okay. Um, uh, one uh, uh, just comment I'll make here is, um, of course, in the lab, you can do the XES at 1 EV resolution. And so there could be uh, some value in uh, measuring the same samples with the lab XES spectrometer and the TES. And that'll give you an idea about the limitations on deconvolution and such things. Yes. Okay. Um, Enthusiastically, yes. <laughs> okay, we'll talk another time. Uh, Matthew yeah. Marcus, you had a great question. Are you there? Yes, I am, now that I've unmuted. And the question was uh, whether it would be useful to publish uh, positions uh, if, uh, that, have been, uh, convol that have been convolved with uh, typical resolutions, like, say, you know, 130 EV. 
And so because after all, not everyone has a TES, but a lot of people have STDs. Right. Um, that is certainly something we've thought about. Uh, what, what collection of derived numbers would be a useful collection? Um, and when you ask for the location at 130 EV, that's more or less asking for the centroid of a line. Um, because none of the features centroid of, a, is a centroid of possibly a cluster of lines is the problem here. That's exactly the problem. Mm -hmm. And right. furthermore, so that you, so you may have, have intense ratio. Yeah, you'd have to convolve it and see where the maximum is or the centroid could certainly do that, but of course the cluster might involve, for example, two lines where one is uh, filling an L1 vacancy, another is filling an L3 vacancy, and that would mean that the relative intensity of these two lines depends on the excitation mechanism and, and the relative amounts of L1 and L3 being mm -hmm. empty. Um, and, but that's not to say we won't do it. We're in the process of trying to finalize a, a manuscript about this. And that's one of the last few issues is thinking about what can we plot or compute and put in an appendix that would be most useful to others, including, for example, those using solid state detectors. Yeah, possibility might be to uh, publish code that would, uh, would let a user compute his own based on, yeah, with, it, with the database inside it. That is an excellent idea. Well, or just the numbers of the void folks, right? If you all use void uh, peaks and you make a collection, just uh, give the numbers from this one in a standard X uh, CSV file. Everybody can uh, broaden it by themselves. Yes, so Jens can broaden his own, and but yeah. it's not necessarily a bad idea to publish code that does it, just as a cross check to make sure you're doing what we had in mind, that, that you got all the factors of root eight log two correct. And things about <laughs> right. Okay, one last question is, um, uh, do you have a good measure of the relative line intensities? Uh, the tabulated probabilities seem questionable uh, for the L lines and especially near the L edges uh, where coaster Kronig effects are expected. Right, right. There is a lot of complicated atomic physics that goes into the theoretical calculations and they do get worse or more complicated near edges. The way we're thinking about the relative intensities is that, you know, we didn't go into this with exquisite control over the excitation. It's a broad uh, Bremsstrahlung exciting uh, spectrum as well as intense L lines of tungsten. So it's not the ideal system for measuring relative intensities. Nevertheless, we measured a ton of lines with high resolution and we know something about their relative intensities, at least in this one condition. And I, I think what we'll do is, is we'll proceed with the publication we're working on now that will be about line energies and spectral profiles. And we've already started working with our new grad student on the possibility of learning about um, relative intensities and, and what we can publish there. But that's not to say we won't publish our raw data. It's just, we still need to figure out how do you learn relative intensities in a transferable way from the raw data we've got.